And so we will read this particular portion of the chapter from verse 19 down to the verse number 27. So, book of Daniel, chapter 4, and reading from verse 19. Let us hear the Word of God. And Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for one hour, and his thoughts troubled him. The king spake and said, Belshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate thee, and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. The tree that thou sawest, which grew and was strong, whose height reached on to the heaven, and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it, and in it was meat for all, under which the base of the field dwelt, and upon whose branches the fowls of the heaven had their habitation. It is thou, O king, that art grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown and reacheth unto heaven, and thy dominion to the end of the earth. And whereas the king saw a watcher and an holy one, and that would be a reference to an angel, coming down from heaven and saying, Hew hew the tree down and destroy it, yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even with a band of iron and, and brass in the tender grass of the field. And let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the base of the field till seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the King, that they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will." And whereas they command it to leave the stump of the tree roots, thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee. After that, thou shalt have known that the heavens do rule. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness, and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. And the Lord will bless the reading of His own Word for His glory and for His name's sake. Open your Bibles to Daniel 4 and have them there open at that chapter and we will come to it now in a moment or two. Daniel 4. But first of all, we'll bow in prayer and we do so with the awareness and the consciousness of our great need of the Lord's help and His blessing, His power. And so let's just bow together and let us unite our hearts in prayer. Our Heavenly Father and our gracious God, we thank Thee for the reminder in this hymn of Christ, the enthroned one, the exalted one. We rejoice that He is there at this moment as we bow together in prayer. At Thy right hand, we thank Thee that He also condescends to come among us people by His Spirit. And we pray that we will know the help of the risen Christ and the Spirit of God moving among us, even now in this season, that we give to the hearing of the Word of God. Bless us, we pray. Shut us in with Thee. Take away every distraction. Give us a mind focused and centered in Christ. We pray in His name and for His glory. Amen and amen. So let's turn to Daniel chapter 4 as we continue with our study in this great prophecy. Now this chapter belongs to a section of the book of Daniel in which the Lord teaches a very important fact in relation to the theme of the book, which is, of course, the theology of time or the doctrine of time. That fact that I refer to is that not only is God sovereign, with regard to time and history, in governing kingdoms and empires, he is also sovereign 
in the lives and in the times and in the histories of individuals. And so on one hand we see God in control of world affairs. On the other hand, we have the discernment to recognize that he is in sovereign control over every person's life. And so on the canvas of time and history, there is the big picture, unmistakably presenting the truth of God's sovereign control at a universal level. But upon stepping closer to the canvas, we begin to notice the elements of detail. And we find that every individual is under that same control and that same sovereign uh, power of God as He rules over history. This fact of God being in charge of the little details of the individual's life is what we are taught in chapters 3 to 6 of this book, especially in these chapters. Now, these chapters are like an interlude. In chapters 1 and 2, the big picture is plainly in view. Chapter 1 gives to us the record of the carrying of thousands of Jews from Judah and Jerusalem to Babylon. And then in chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar's first vision, in which he sees this view of four great world empires that come in succession, the one after the other, along with a fifth kingdom, the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then after these four chapters, three to six, we come back to the big picture from chapter seven onwards, right through to chapter 12, the very close of this prophecy of Daniel. And in those chapters, the Holy Spirit focuses our minds once again upon kingdoms and empires and rulers and other great events, all revolving around Christ the Messiah and His first coming, and then a second coming. It's all in the latter part of this book. But sandwiched in between these two portions are these four chapters, chapters 3, 4, 5, and 6. And in them, the issue of God's control of the little elements is plainly revealed. It's revealed in how He deals with individuals. And here in chapter 4, we come to look again at Nebuchadnezzar, who is dealt with by God in a very personal manner. Now, to be precise, Daniel 4 presents a striking transformation in the life of this man, Nebuchadnezzar. God dealt with this man in a powerful way. This mighty man became a different man. This great emperor was reduced to the level where he suddenly saw that he was just but a man and a sinner in the hands of the great God of heaven. And he is brought to an end of himself. And so in him, he is now a different man. In himself, he's a different man. In him, there is a transformation. I indicated to you last week that it is my own personal view that God's dealings with Nebuchadnezzar on this occasion resulted in his spiritual conversion. He became a child of God. Nebuchadnezzar's transformation, therefore, was much more than a reformation of behavior or an alteration of his attitude. Yes, that did happen. But it happened because of a deep work of grace by which he was regenerated, by which he was born again, as he demonstrated so clearly in what he says, as is recorded for us in this marvelous chapter. Now, quickly, an outline of this chapter might be helpful to you because when you read this chapter, you might get a bit puzzled about the order of the words or the verses. The chapter begins in verses 1 to 3 with what we can call a doxology. It's a hymn of praise uttered by Nebuchadnezzar as he reflects on what God had done in his life. Then from chapter, sorry, from verse 4 to verse 27, there's a detailed account of his dream. This second vision that he had, as we find in the book of Daniel, uh, there's a detailed account of that dream. And then Daniel's interpretation of it. Then from verse 28 to verse 23, we have Daniel recording the fulfillment 
of what God showed to Nebuchadnezzar in that dream. And from verse 34 to verse 37, we have Nebuchadnezzar's personal witness for the Lord in a most powerful profession of faith, a most powerful declaration of how he had come to know this true God and had come to see him as his God. It's very clear, therefore, from Nebuchadnezzar's testimony that the Lord did deal with him in a manner that affected him in relation to his time and to his eternity. That's the matter I want you to think about. Here is God coming to deal with an individual about his time and his eternity. And the evidence is here that God did so. And the evidence is here that the pagan king was converted. I showed you last week at one point in the message that at this stage, Nebuchadnezzar departs from the page of Scripture Uh, from the stage in what Daniel is showing us, and he is never mentioned again in the book of Daniel or anywhere else in Scripture. What he did for the remainder of his time in Babylon's affairs is not mentioned. Now, he's mentioned briefly in chapter 5, simply as Daniel reminds Belshazzar. We're going to get to that hopefully maybe next week. But as Daniel reminded, uh, reminded Belshazzar what had happened to Nebuchadnezzar. But I'm talking about Nebuchadnezzar's life and actions and so on. You never read of the man again. But the fact that the closing reference to him on the sacred page is one that's couched in the language of a very clear and remarkable profession of faith is highly significant. It points to the fact that Nebuchadnezzar was never the same again. It reminds us that God's dealings with this man were deep and they were powerful. And so he leaves the page of Scripture as a man converted to God. I was reading Matthew Henry. He is a very sane, sensible commentator on Scripture. And I looked at what Matthew Henry had to say just on this very point. And he said this, commenting on the issue of Nebuchadnezzar's conversion. Uh, Matthew Henry wrote, If so great a blasphemer and persecutor did find mercy, he was not the last. And if our charity may reach so far as to hope he did, we must admire free grace. And he makes this very striking remark, by which he lost his wits for a while that he might save his soul forever. What a statement. And so the evidence for Nebuchadnezzar's conversion can be gleaned from this chapter. On the basis of this evidence, we are able to look at him in a threefold way. And I set out last week to do that and only got through the first point, which of course is fine. Uh, There's plenty of time to us just to look at this carefully. So we're coming back to it today. And that point last week was... We viewed him as a challenged man. God challenged Nebuchadnezzar about his sin. About his sin of pride. That sin that motivated him in his blasphemous and in his cruel actions. And we considered three aspects of the challenge that God brought to Nebuchadnezzar. It's commencement. I looked with you at the end of chapter 2 and the end of chapter 3, and we discovered that before chapter 4 came, comes around, God had commenced already to challenge Nebuchadnezzar because it began to show him through Daniel's interpretation of his first dream and through what happened to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in chapter 3 that he is the true God. And, and Nebuchadnezzar begins to see this at the end of those two chapters. His own words are there in which he relates how he has been impacted and he's been shown something of the majesty and the glory of the Lord. So you have the commencement of God's challenge of Nebuchadnezzar. You have the continuation of it now in chapter 4 because here's a vision given to Nebuchadnezzar. And remember what I told you last week, and this is very important, while God does not speak to us anymore in dreams and visions... Yet he did in those days, before the Bible was complete, 
Nebuchadnezzar didn't have the Bible, remember? And God spoke to him, but the point is, it was God's Word. God's challenge to Nebuchadnezzar continued through his own Word coming to this man's soul. And I showed you how that bears out Paul's theology. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And God continued His challenge through the revelation of the Word, through the explanation of the Word, because Daniel explained it to him, and by the application of the Word to his heart. And then we finally looked at the counsel that he was given by God as he challenged him. He was counseled to repent and to break off from his sins. When you read verse 27, it's like any preacher today standing before a congregation and telling his listeners to break off your sins and repent. Very same message. And so we come, therefore, having seen him as a challenged man, to look at two other views of Nebuchadnezzar that I didn't reach last week. And we're going to take it up there today. And first of all today, let's view him as a conquered man. A conquered man. Now, the Lord challenged him, and then he conquered him. That's the divine order in conversion. Remember that Nebuchadnezzar's chief sin was his pride, and so the Lord set out to conquer this man, having challenged him about his pride. He then sets out to conquer him by humbling him. Look at verse 16. Verse 16, and this is part of the dream or the vision that he had, and it was being said by this angel that came down from heaven. Verse 16, let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. And the sense of that language is that God, and this is remarkable, brethren and sisters, but it's true, God smote Nebuchadnezzar with madness with insanity, and it lasted for seven years. He went out of his mind. If you go down to verse number 33, you will find, as Daniel comments on this or interprets this or refers to it, it says this, Daniel 4.33, The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men, did eat grass as oxen, His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hairs were grown like eagles' feathers and his nails like birds' claws. For seven years, Nebuchadnezzar was brought into a state in which he believed, in which he behaved like an animal. He thought he was an ox. Now, I am not being funny here and we should not see this as amusing. This is true. This is how God dealt with this man. He actually went out of his mind. For seven years he continued in that state. He thought he was a cow. He ate grass. He stayed outside. Imagine the scene. There he is, the dweller in that magnificent palace with its hanging gardens in that great city of Babylon. But for seven years he's outside somewhere. We're not not told where in terms of precise location, but he's certainly not in the palace. He's driven out. He's living like a cow in the field eating grass. I wonder what the spin doctors had to say in those days. How did they explain this? Because, remember something, they would have been covering up all the time trying to make out, oh, there's nothing wrong with him. He's, he's okay, and he's just taking a break. You can be dead on sure that the spin doctors of those days, just as they do today, try to put a different face in this whole situation. But God was dealing with him. God was conquering this man by means of this humbling process. It is important to understand, leaving aside the uniqueness of this whole situation, it's important to understand, as we think about God conquering this man, that the Lord does humble those whom He saves, whom He converts to Himself. He humbles them by conquering the pride that is native to the human heart. There's a clear intimation of this in that great statement in Psalm 110 verse 3. 
where the psalmist David, as he writes of Christ after the cross and after his ascension to heaven, says, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And then verse 3 says, Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. And let me tell you, friend, in your own experience you can testify to this. One way or the other, to one degree or another, God had to humble you. Because remember that pride is the chief sin of the human heart. And pride is always dealt with by God. And those words, thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, is a reference to the exalted Christ at God's right hand, who has redeemed sinners by his own blood. He has procured the right to make them his own. And throughout the entire New Testament age, which is in view in that psalm, he accomplishes his conquest of them by making them willing in the day of his power, which means he humbles them. He humbles them. Take, for example, Saul of Tarsus. And again, I know that his conversion was unique. But draw the principles out of it. There he is in the Damascus Road, a proud Pharisee, a man who's bent on the destruction of the people of God, scattering the church every way he possibly can, and driving the saints into prison. But the Lord humbles him. And he falls into the dust on the Damascus Road. And he's conquered by Christ. And the evidence that he has conquered by Christ is found in two prayers that he prayed immediately. Number one, who art thou, Lord? Which simply means, I want to know more about thee. doesn't mean he didn't know who this was. He actually calls him Lord. It means I want to know more. Who art thou, Lord? And his second prayer, uh, his second prayer was, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? That's remarkable. And I say to you today that the evidence of a conquered, humble heart, the evidence of true conversion and a work of grace is this matter of being humbled by God, humility setting in, a feeling of nothingness coming over the soul, an awareness of guilt and shame and condemnation. That's God humbling the sinner. And that continues right through the believer's life because we're all continually in need of being humbled. There's the initial humbling at conversion, but it doesn't stop there because that old sin of pride can rise up so frequently and at times so devastatingly. But the prayer of the Christian needs to be this. Every day, as the Lord himself prayed, how remarkable he had no pride For he is without sin, but as he prayed, not my will, but thine be done. That's the prayer that you and I are to take. And so the steps in the Lord's conquest of Nebuchadnezzar are seen clearly here as he begins to humble this man and deal with this man. There is his divine patience. Notice the words of verse 29 here. And we see this issue of God conquering this man, humbling him, conquering him, and there is divine patience in it all. Look at verse number 29. At the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. What we learn here is that after 12 months, a year later, Nebuchadnezzar had still not repented. Instead, he was boasting, he was bragging, in spite of what God already had shown him. The dream had come, the vision had come. Daniel had explained it. And Daniel warned him, told him, Nebuchadnezzar, break off from your sins. But a whole year later, he hasn't listened. And God would have been perfectly right in destroying Nebuchadnezzar immediately because he was provoking God to his very face. Look at that 29th verse again in Daniel 4. 
It says, or the, the next verse after, it says, The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built? And so on and so on. It was all about him, all about what he had done. There's no humility yet. There is no brokenness yet. There is no conquest yet. And therefore, what we notice is, here is divine patience. The Lord, you see, intended to convert this man. And so he dealt with him patiently. And that detail of divine patience, is it not seen right through the whole of the Bible? Does this story, this account, not, and I use the term again, does it not put a face now on Peter's theology? You say, what's Peter's theology? Let me show it to you. Turn please to Second Peter chapter 3. And look at verses 9 and 15, 2 Peter 3 and the verse number 9, where it says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And then verse number 15, where it says, Account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. Notice those terms. There's Peter's theology about divine patience. He's long-suffering. He says, Peter says in verse 9, that when men scoff about the Lord and His promise concerning the second coming, he says, I want to remind you the Lord's not slack. He keeps His word. So why has He not come? This is Peter's argument. Because He's patient. He's long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish. I notice how that verse is written. I want you to see it in his own setting. Long suffering to us word. Long suffering to us word. Who's us word? The saints. Whom he gathers in. And it's not the Lord's will that one of them should perish. So he patiently deals with them and saves them and brings them in down through the course of time. And that's what verse 15 therefore means. The long-suffering of the Lord is salvation. The long-suffering of the Lord translates into our salvation. That's Paul, Peter's theology with regard to the long-suffering of God. And God dealt patiently with Nebuchadnezzar. And may I say, in the issue of the preaching of the gospel, to you in this house at this moment, who have sat maybe for more than 12 months, maybe beyond many years, and God has been long-suffering with you. And yet, you have not humbled yourself before Him. We would have you say with a hymn writer, I have long withstood his grace. Long provoked him to his face. Would not hearken to his calls. Grieved him by a thousand falls. That's you. And yet God has you here today. You're alive. You're in this meeting. Oh, my dear friend, do not despise the long suffering of God. There's divine patience as God conquered Nebuchadnezzar. Then there's also divine precision. Turn back to Daniel 4. And I refer to divine precision in the sense that when the Lord intends to convert a sinner, <clears throat> he will move at a given moment. And he will move irresistibly so. Verse 28. You see it there of Daniel chapter 4. All this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. <clears throat> and then verse number 31. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. Now just look at those two statements, because they show this divine precision. And notice in those two statements, the issue of God's precision in his conquest of sinners is clearly portrayed. It is infallible. Verse number 28, look at that verse again. All this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. What the Lord said he was going to do with this man, it came to pass as he had purposed. 
All this came to pass. There's divine precision, and it's infallible in being divine precision. And in this context here, the matter is to the conquering and the humbling and the saving of a sinner. And we're we're noticing here that God works in this infallible precision in men's hearts. When the time comes, He will work. He will do what He has said. He will move. He will intervene. That doesn't obviate us of our responsibility to preach and pray and labor and work. The two go together. We can't tell God's time. This divine precision is beyond our minds to foresee or foretell and say it's going to happen here, happen there, whatever. We we can't do that. It is a fact. Divine precision is shown here, and therefore there is infallible. It will happen as God intends it. But you and I as Christians, as the church of God, we are in the meanwhile. Keep on praying. Keep on preaching. Keep on witnessing. Keep on living for the Lord. And one of these moments is going to break in and do something on your behalf. Infallible precision, precision, but as also this divine precision, it is irresistible. Verse 31 again of Daniel 4. And notice the thought and the fact of it being irresistible. While the word was in the king's mouth. And that's the word that's in verse 30, his boasting, his bragging about what he had done and the palace he had built and the city he had built and so on. And his majesty, he's bragging about it, he's talking about it, he's still not humbled. But in that very moment, here's divine precision. While the word was in his mouth, while he was still speaking against God, there fell a voice from heaven. And the whole thing came to pass. And God irresistibly began to work and humble this man. Now you, dear Christians, brethren and sisters, who are faithfully praying for sinners, and they're proud and they're defiant of God and the gospel, and they resist every plea that you make, and they grieve your heart and they break your soul many a time and your tears flow and you wonder, are they ever going to be saved? Will God ever have mercy on them? Oh, take encouragement from this today. Because God has not only divine patience, but God has divine precision. And infallibly and irresistibly He steps in and He deals with this soul and the other soul or even multitudes that any given time. Oh, what scenes develop when God begins to move. I've been reading a book over the past weeks, a wonderful book called The Spiritual Awakeners. And it's a presentation of the great ministries of men beginning with a man called Solomon Stoddard, who was Jonathan Edwards' grandfather in New England, Massachusetts, New England, way back in the early 1700s. And and then Jonathan Edwards himself, his grandson, and on into other days, men like Tennant and those great preachers, Wesley and Whitfield and all of the rest of them, and right down to even this past century, and what a catalogue of mighty awakenings and revivals, both here in the UK. He mentions Ulster in it as an American writer. And he mentions Scotland, Wales, England, the great movements of God, as well as his own land. And the remarkable thing is, as that story shows, and any story of revival shows, after so much time, after so many have provoked the Lord's face, suddenly the Lord breaks in and proud, hardened sinners are melted and and they're brought to nothing and they are made humble before God. And I, I encourage you today, keep on praying, brother, for that son or that daughter, that family member, neighbors, friends. Let us not give up. Let us pray. Pray for your husband, your wife, your children your grandchildren, 
because God, I know they're not Nebuchadnezzar's, but take the, the teaching here. God conquered this man. Divine patience, divine precision, but then also divine power. Nebuchadnezzar was an autocrat. That means that he alone ruled in Babylon. His word, that's it. That's what he was. He's called, remember in chapter 2, a king of kings. All other kings are subservient, subservient to him. He rules. But he was subservient to the God of heaven. And God conquered this man by beginning to take away from him a variety of things that he cherished. Look at them quickly. Verse 31, the closing words of verse 31. Those words, the kingdom is departed from thee. That meant for seven years as it translated or transpired, you're going to be without rulership. I'm taking your kingdom away. Then verse 32 the opening words, and they shall drive thee from men. And then verse 32, you'll eat grass like an oxen, and so on and so on. The Lord took away from this man his kingdom, his authority, and his dignity. Well, what he thought was dignity. The Lord intends to deal with this man, and in his power, this is what he does He removes all these things. I want you to notice that. This is how God works with people who may be stubborn and willful and and negligent and defiant. He begins to take things away from them. The things that they love. The sins that they cherish. the, The situations that they believe are indispensable to them. They can't do without them. And God begins to take them away one by one. He begins to strip them of all in which they trust and in which they delight. Won't you turn just a couple of chapters into the book of Hosea? Hosea chapter 2 to a very interesting passage. And I want you to see this because it illustrates and it teaches the same fact that I'm showing you. In God's divine power, He takes things away from people as He deals with them and conquers them. And so Hosea chapter 2, I'm not going to read all the verses for time's sake, but verse 9 is where we should begin to read. We're going to take a reading here. And the Lord says in verse 9 of Hosea 2, Therefore will I return, listen to this please, and take away my corn in the time thereof, my wine in the season thereof, and will recover my wool and my flax, and so on. Now read those words carefully. Because they're referring to everyday things, aren't they? To food and drink and clothing and so on. And here are Israel and they're so proud. They are so defiant of God. And they believe that by their own strength and abilities, they have acquired all these things. They're just like the farmers and the businessmen of today who believe with all their hearts that what they now own, they have done this themselves. God says, I'm going to start taking it all away. And if we had time, we could read on down. I want you to go to verse 14 of Hosea 2, and here's the climax. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. He takes away all this other amount of stuff that's mentioned in order to Bring her into the wilderness. Do you notice that? I'm going to allure her. I'm drawing Israel. I'm working with Israel. I'm going to bring her back. I'm going to allure her. Oh, Israel's a backslider. Backslidden nation. And the Lord's dealing with the backslider. And he starts to take away all these things. Here's divine power. Let me tell you, my friend, if you defy God, if you resist God, God could strip you of everything that you cherish. He could take it all away. He has the power to do that. And that's what he did with Nebuchadnezzar. He left him like an animal in a field, eating grass, because 
He's getting this man's attention. And what a way to do it. But do you see it? And maybe God has been dealing with you in, in these ways, conquering your soul, dealing with your heart. I say to you, sinner, you beware, lest the Lord does not leave you utterly desolate. But seek him as he deals with you. Backslider, come home to the Lord and return to your first love. It's so applicable. He was a challenged man, and now we see him as a conquered man. But then, this final view of this man is we view him as a changed man. He's a changed man. Oh, what a wonderful thing when God changes people. That's grace. That's salvation. They're not the same. They're different. And we see the change that comes about in Nebuchadnezzar from verse 34, as I showed you in the outline of the chapter, to verse 37. There's a record of Nebuchadnezzar's profession of faith. We can call it that because that's a very biblical term. It's a profession. It's a confession in which he tells us of how the Lord challenged him, conquered him, and then changed him. That's what it's all about. Now, he was converted to God. And he professed it in his own words. Remember what Paul says, taking again Paul's theology, Romans 9, sorry, Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, you have it there, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth he professes. What God does in the heart comes out of the mouth in profession. In confession. And so we see it here in Nebuchadnezzar. And we notice in this changing of this man that he was given perception. His perception. Verse 34 of Daniel 4. The opening words. Notice what it says. At the end of the days I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me. Understanding returns. Verse 36. He says, at the same time, my reason returned unto me. Here's the, de- here's the evidence that he had lost his mind, that he had been stricken with insanity. You imagine this? God drove him mad in order to save him. Because he's God. And then his, re- his understanding returns. His reasoning returns. He's no longer insane. But you know, it's much more than that. He now has spiritual understanding and perception. Just look at the opening verses of the chapter, verses 1 to 3. Here is Nebuchadnezzar singing, if you will, because it's all about praise. Nebuchadnezzar the king unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell on the earth. Now, do you notice how this begins? He addresses people across the world. Then he says in verse 2, I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. It's very personal. How great are his signs. How mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And his dominion is from generation to generation. And I don't believe for one second that those are the words of a man who went to hell. Those are the words of a man who has come to know God. And he sings, or he, he, he pronounces there, this great confession. And then verse 37. And it says at the end of the chapter, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment. And those that walk in pride, he's able to abase. Notice that. There's a very personal thing as far as he's concerned. Those who walk in pride, he's saying, that was me. But he humbled me. And now I'm telling what the Lord has done for my soul. All of that is the evidence of him being a changed man. He has now got perception and understanding. My dear friend, the Bible makes it so clear that a person cannot own God as Lord without the Holy Spirit. It's elementary. 
people who may puzzle over this and say, oh, he wasn't saved at all. They're not reading it right. Because in these verses, he is owning the God of heaven as Lord. He's actually talking about Christ. And he calls him Lord. And Paul tells me in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 3, No man can call Jesus Lord but by the Holy Ghost. And that is not merely saying Jesus is Lord. That is owning him and recognizing him as Lord and, and bowing to him and, and, and living for him. And 1 Corinthians 2, verses 9 and 10. In verse 9, Paul says, I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. And let me say again to you, that's not talking about heaven. That's talking about the state of the unsaved man, the unregenerate heart. The eye of man, the ear of man, the heart of man just does not understand what? The things that God has prepared for those who love Him, which is what? The gospel. So how does a man understand? Verse 10, But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. Perception. Calling Jesus Lord. And so he's a changed man because he now has perception, he has understanding. Then we've noticed his praise already. So there is his perception, there is his praise. He utters praise here. It's so clear. It's so powerful. He blesses the true God. He rejoices before the true God. He exalts the true God. What is this? There's a new song in his mouth. I waited patiently for the Lord and he heard my cry and he brought me also out of an horrible pit and out of the miry clay and he has put a new song in my mouth, Psalm 40. Even praise unto our God, many shall see it and shall rely and trust in the Lord. Is this not what is happening here? Nebuchadnezzar As I showed you from the very first verse of this chapter, he wants the whole world to hear what God did for him. And the world is hearing. The world's reading this. Well, people who read the Bible across the world, they're reading this story. They're hearing about this man. His testimony is in holy writ. His perception is praise and then his proclamation. Verse 34. Look at that great statement where he goes on to say, after saying that his understanding had returned, verse 34, he says this, I blessed the Most High. I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. He's talking about a spiritual kingdom here, not an earthly kingdom. He's talking about God's kingdom as an everlasting kingdom, that spiritual kingdom of God and of Christ that rules over everything. Verse 35, And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? There's his proclamation. When God changed and converted him, truth took hold of his heart. Truth, truth got a grip in his soul and he wrote his own creed, his own confession of faith. Marvelous proclamation in those words, 34 and 35. The one true and living God, sovereign over all. Yesterday I was examining some of the children along with two other ministers in our Sunday school exam and I was dealing with a lot in the, the more senior years and in the catechism. And it was wonderful to hear them give their answers. Wonderful. You know, in many a church today, in fact, how do I put this to get it right, to get it across to you,
In most churches today, the catechism has been thrown out. The shorter catechism. What a shame. But only a shame. It's a mistake. It is a tragic mistake. I remember rhyming them off. And had not a clue what it was rhyming. But when the Lord saved me, it all made sense. Parents, you drill them into your children. But as I listened to those young fellows and girls yesterday, just rhyming them off. Such a blessing to my soul. A confession of faith. At least as far as that goes, the one true and living God and the mediator and all that Christ is to those who know him. Nebuchadnezzar, a challenged man, a man who was conquered, a man who was changed. What a story you have in in Daniel 4. Next week, we're going to come to chapter 5. And what do we see there? We see the very opposite. A condemned man. We want to look at him. Make sure that you're in the category in which Nebuchadnezzar lies. Not in the one that poor Belshazzar occupied and still does to this still does to this very moment because he's lost. Let us bow in prayer. And may God write his word on every heart. Let's bow before the Lord <clears throat> here in quietness, reverence, before we come to a close in a word of prayer. Lord, use thy word, we pray. Write it powerfully upon our souls. Apply it to hearts and minds. Build up the saints. Encourage believers Arrest the backslider, the unconverted. Do the work that only thou art able to do. Move in power this day. O God, have thy way in people's lives. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.